Hi friends, good evening and welcome to another live episode of Hashtag SU with Cecil Hinova here with my lone guest for tonight. And I think this is going to be an exciting evening because we shall be talking about a diversity of topics. Now, may I introduce to you our, well, eminent, distinguished guest for tonight because not only is he the lone guest, but he promises to talk to us about many, many things. I'd like to welcome to Dumaguete, I'd like to welcome to our show on Hashtag SU, Mr. David Haldane, right? Yes. Uh, an American journalist and at the same time a book author, a first timer in the city of Dumaguete. And may I mention this, if I have some students who are watching us tonight, he will be our guest lecturer tomorrow in our class in media and information literacy. Hi, David. I have to say hi and allow you to say hi to our television audience. Hi there. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Yes, and you are coming all the way from California? Yes, Southern California. Okay, Southern California, but you have actually been to some parts of the Philippines and the Visayas before coming over to Dumaguete, yes, right? Yes, we actually came over uh, to break ground on a home uh, mm. in Surigao. Okay. And. Uh, my wife, Ivy, yes. and I came here, and mm -hmm. that's what brought us here, and that's kind of what my book is about. Yes. Okay, good that you mentioned your book, because we can actually show your book, and that is the title of our episode for today. It's called, and I think we can show it on screen, Nazis and Nudists. Yes, there you go. Mm -hmm. Very interesting title. It is. Because it's a actu actually a combination of two terms that I think many of our televiewers are familiar with, but if you combine them, I think that is where you can come in to explain it to us, David. Yes, uh, it, of course it's a provocative title and mm -hmm. that's never bad for a book, <laughs> but it actually does come from the book, it's mm -hmm. not just uh, okay. uh, gratuitous. Um, and there's a chapter called Nazis and a chapter called Nudists. Oh, separate uh, chapters. Separate mm -hmm. chapters. Uh, and nudist really is, uh, you know, a lot of the book is about my experience. It's a, it's a memoir, it's an autobiography, mm -hmm. and it begins and ends in the Philippines. Okay. But in between those two points, uh, there's a lot about the counterculture of the mm. 1960s and 70s in California and in the United States, mm -hmm. about the hippies, about okay. the revolutionaries of those years, and I was one of them. And anyone who knows anything about that era knows that nudism was a great big part of that. Okay. And the chapter called Nudist actually mm -hmm. is, is a, about an experience I had uh, spending a summer on a Greek island mm -hmm. which began with my taking my clothes off oh. and I didn't come back on for three months until three? My goodness. Til the end of the trip. So that's where that comes from. It, was it a nudist camp? Well, you know, we didn't call it that, mm -hmm. but I suppose it could be called that. It was really a bunch of hippies living, okay. living in a little camping out on the beach, okay. you know, without any clothes. So the flower power generation. Yes, definitely. Okay. So definitely. during that particular time, that was the prevalent uh, atmosphere Absolutely. Or it scenario. Was, it was kind of do your own thing, yes. you know, relax. Uh, uh -huh. And I think the, a big part of that era was uh, back to nature, you know, mm -hmm. living. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it was a rejection of materialism, okay. a rejection of the, of the uh, what we considered a very staid and mm -hmm. restrictive uh, society. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, what, what, what's a more visual, mm -hmm. you know, and, and symbolic rejection of that? than rejecting clothes. That's the, the ultimate back to nature. Okay. You know? And that's really what that was about. Yes, back so. to nature, back to basics. Yes. Uh, something like, uh, let, let's go back from, from day one, uh, when we let's, were born. Exactly, yeah. let's Some, go back to, yeah. to when life was simple and, uh, we, and we could do anything we want. We were free. Correct. I was about to say that, being free-spirited. Yes. But David, yes. before we go into, I think you can read some of the portions of your memoir, well, I, right? I should also, though, explain where the Nazis came Ah, from. okay, fine. Okay, <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. Where, okay. How did it come about? Okay, that's, uh, that's an interesting, that's another chapter, and, and uh, that's another experience that I had uh, living in Germany, in Berlin, Germany. My mother was a Holocaust survivor. Uh, so she was a German Jew whose entire family pretty much was wiped out by the Nazis. Therefore, I grew up, you know, thinking of Nazis really as not people, you know. These were the monsters of history. So I ended up living in Berlin and befriending a young man uh, who was my roommate, who I loved dearly. 
And only after becoming friends did I learn that he was actually the son of a Nazi. His father had been one of the people, you know, involved in the Holocaust okay. that had killed my family. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so it was, and, 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 and we, when we learned that, he, it was, a, it was a, a kind of a karmic moment for both of us. He had never met a Jew, I had never met anything resembling a Nazi, and I think that uh, it was a karmic moment for both of us, and we kind of came to terms with, you know, all the baggage of that. And for me, I have to say that uh, it was the first time I actually saw a Nazi as a human being, because here, you know, I've been brought up to think of a Nazi as a monster. Correct. And here was this man talking about his father in great loving terms, mm -hmm. what a wonderful father and son and, and husband he was. Mm -hmm. And it was the first time that I realized that, you know, even a Nazi who's a monster during the day has a wife and a son who loves him and comes home to a family. And I have to say that it, it really informed my... Okay. Uh, my future career in journalism and it allowed me to see the world the way a journalist needs to see it which is yeah. in all its complexity and all its okay. subtlety and so, so he was a human being the exactly that right. roommate that you had actually met exactly did it right change did it change altogether your perception of him as a person as against those whom you have met even before him or even after him well um I realized, of course, that you know it, his father had been the Nazi, not okay. him. Not him. Okay. So, so it, I'd never blamed him, but okay, of course. But it made me realize that mm -mm. people are complex. Mm. People are multi-dimensional, yes. not one-dimensional. Yes. Great. That that you can be many things to different people mm -hmm. at the same time. You can That's be a monster to one person okay. and a loving husband yeah, to another definitely. person. Definitely. And I yeah. think when you're a journalist, mm -mm. that's the way you need to approach people mm -mm. because you find yourself, uh, and I certainly did mm -mm. many times, dealing with people who uh, were multidimensional. And my task as a journalist was to understand them, to see them, to, uh, to try and, at least for a minute, mm -hmm. see the world through their eyes, correct, to correct. see it from their point of view. Yeah. And if you can do that, it, it, it makes you a much better journalist. Correct. And and I believe that, yeah, know. that's right. And maybe listen to their stories exactly. because they have stories to tell, right? Exactly and right. And it's your job as a journalist to tell and retell these stories. Exactly right. Okay. And you sort of suspend your own uh, yeah. prejudices, correct. your own uh, right. feelings, as that's strong right. as they may be. Yeah for the sake of the yes. story. Yes, I'm curious, uh, David, how old were you when you were in Berlin and how long did you stay there? Well, I think oh. I was in Berlin for about a year and okay. I was in my early 20s, probably oh. about 22 years pretty, old. So. Pretty young, no? Very for, young. But you were already a practicing journalist at that time? No, not no, yet? Not, not, yet? Not, not yet, not yet, not yet. Not yet. You were well on your way to uh, practicing journalism. Well, I was still a few years away. Okay. I think I was, I think at that point I was sort of developing the point of view of a journalist, ah, you know, beginning okay. to see the world Okay. as a journalist okay. but it was several yeah. years before oh, I actually years, yeah. well I would say at least at least three or four years three before four, I yeah. actually began practicing okay. and that again was in the counterculture ah, uh, okay. you know a few yeah. years later yes yes okay so that's how the title Nazis and nudists came about but yes. very quickly before we move on to another topic how influential was that particular experience of yours in Berlin how how influential and how did it shape you're being a journalist years later. I think it was a life-changing mm, event. Okay. You know, I think that it it, it uh, enabled me mm. to be a much better journalist, okay. and it helped me develop the point of view that a journalist needs. So I think it was a major life-changing event. Okay. That's why I put it in the yeah. title and in the book. Yeah. So let's uh, fast track. I want to backtrack. Fast track to today, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. You were with uh, the LA Times. You worked there for yes. about 23 years, That's right? True. Yes. You were in the print medium. You were a journalist. But now you are into radio, right? You're yes, a broadcaster. Well, well, I still do print. I uh -huh. I, I'm retired from daily journalism. Daily so journalism. I, so I don't work for a newspaper okay. anymore. But I still do magazine pieces. And okay. I wrote this book just last year, and I'm promoting the book. And okay. I also do work part-time for a radio station. Ah, now, yeah. right? Yes, in yes. Uh, California. Yes. Right? Okay, where you live with, with Ivy. Exactly. Actually, I wonder, maybe our camera can pan... Uh, to Ivy, maybe later, <laughs> because Ivy is actually here, and she's Filipina uh, from Suri Shargao Surigao. Am uh -huh, I correct? Uh -huh. Sh Su Suri uh, Shargao Surigao, uh -huh. and you are both here yes. uh, as guests, actually, of uh, a university here yes. in the city of Dumaguete, yes. because one of your colleagues actually worked with you 
uh, or or uh, yeah, is yeah. part owner of the That's university. That's right. His family owns yes, the university. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yes. the family. But uh, essentially, you were together in LA Times, right? Yes. yes. That's right. Yeah. But I'd like to I'd like now to focus on your book, uh, okay. David. Right. Okay. Because after all, this is what you came here for. Mm -hmm. You you composed this as you had mentioned. It's a memoir, and it, it's highly autobiographical. Yes. And maybe this is where you can highlight some of the best chapters, some of the best moments in your life, and perhaps later on we can read some uh, passages or certain... Okay, well, yeah. I, could, I okay. could begin actually by reading a passage right ah, now. Ah, great. Uh, okay. Which is part of the prologue, mm -hmm. and this uh, really, if I can figure out how to hold the mic okay. and hold the book at yeah. the same time, ah. that's okay. Is it difficult? It's yeah, okay. okay, I can do it. Yeah. Um, and this is really uh, how the book begins, and mm. it kind of sets the tone for the book, ah, okay. and it's about... Uh, about um, it's in the Philippines, so mm -hmm. it's a prologue of the book. It's called Boats with Holes. Okay. Okay. We were a mile off the coast of a remote Philippine island when I realized that the boat was sinking. Perhaps, I mused, it was because of those holes. One was in the gas tank, which meant that we were stranded. The other in the hull, which meant that we'd be swamped. The plain truth was that we were taking on water like, well, a boat with two holes. Hey, Laloy, I called out to the captain and our guide. Is this normal? Mr. David, he implored with a toothy grin. Do not worry. Putting aside all pretense of dignity, I grabbed a red sweatshirt, waved it like a flag, and started to yell. Yeah. And then Though my companions had not joined in my antics, they definitely looked concerned. Honey, calm down, Ivy said, looking distinctly embarrassed. Sir David, Loloy implored, twisting a strand of his silky black hair, please, we are okay. It turned out that he was right. 20 minutes later, and having nothing to do with my frantic theatrics, a passing octopus fisherman offered a tow. There are moments in life when certain insights are unavoidable. As we eased our way slowly toward harbor with the air tasting especially sweet, and our nostrils flaring with the smell of salt, I couldn't help but notice the demeanor of my fellow travelers. It was exactly the same now as it had, as it had been in the crisis, smiling, calm, steadfast, and trusting. I had observed this cultural trait before, the simple, unflappable Filipino faith that no matter what happens, despite overwhelming evidence to the contrary, everything will be all right. David, listening to you with that beautiful prose, actually a combination of literary mm -hmm. and journalistic writing, I have to take my hat off to you. Well, huh? thank you. A, a great combination, not many people are able to do that actually, combining the best characteristics, the best elements of both mm -hmm. literary writing, literary mm -hmm. would probably mean, would, would mean fiction mm -hmm. uh, as a matter of fact, and also journalistic writing, which is difficult to do. But you were able to pull it through with your great story. Storytelling. Thank you. Yeah. Well, it's a. Uh, it, this is actually a genre. I mean, there's a whole new genre in journalism called creative nonfiction. You know, we have that in the Philippines as well. Great that you mentioned it. Great. And yeah. that's really. This is uh, one example of, of that kind of writing. This is autobiographical. A lot oh. of creative uh, writing uh, yeah. nonfiction is mm. not autobiographical. Uh -huh. not, uh, not necessarily. They don't follow. Right? Not necessarily. Yeah. And okay. I've done some of that as well, where mm -hmm. you actually do a story, maybe a profile of mm -hmm. someone else. Mm -hmm. But the okay. the technique for creative nonfiction mm -hmm. is to write it uh, as a story. Write it so that it it sounds like fiction, but it's not. Exactly, it's really true. exactly. You know, David, tomorrow, if I may have to preempt this, but I think uh, some of our students are actually listening on, in on us. They are senior high schoolers, and you have known and read perhaps mm -hmm. that uh, the Philippines, including Silliman University, and all the other universities are actually now starting to offer senior high school, very much like the US, Europe, and other parts of mm -hmm, the world. Mm -hmm. And the students who will be listening in to you tomorrow are actually students of the academic track. Some are in arts and design. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the best avenue for them to be able to listen to someone who's a practitioner, and quite a number of them, because this is going to be a media and information literacy class. Mm -hmm. Many mm -hmm. would like to go into media, both in print as well as in broadcast. But talking about creative nonfiction, uh, it's also 
pretty a uh, it's it's pretty much a growing genre as well in yeah, the Philippine so. setting in the yeah. Philippine setting yeah. a, a an organization that uh, actually also gives out awards on writing has uh, if i have to say this uh, given given creative nonfiction a boost no by adding this as a category oh, in their in their contest or in their writing contest and i think this one is uh, a very good example of how it is to write creative nonfiction. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm, is mm -hmm. this also a, a, a growing uh, phenomenon in the U.S. and in well, other parts of the world? Um, certainly it is in the U.S. Um, it really started in the U.S. in the 1960s with, uh, and back then it was called the New Journalism. Mm. And there was a whole genre of writing, uh, including uh, writers like Tom Wolfe and, uh, and others who, who uh, Norman Mailer did a lot of this and that was the beginning and uh, then it kind of fell into disfavor for a while but I think it's it's coming back and I think a large reason is because of the internet and blogs you know people have uh, the ability to write and publish anything now uh, you know we have the technology where anybody can publish anything and I think that's kind of a double-edged sword in a way it's in a way it's been very liberating because it allows people to do creative nonfiction or anything but it's also kind of um, been bad you know in some ways for traditional journalism be which is based on fact you know uh, because we don't have traditionally there was a hierarchy of, of editors who sort of oversaw all this and at least kept you within the realm of reason and fact you know that's no longer true, at least not to the same extent. It's, it's, it's losing that. And so as a result, I think we have a, a lot of writing that, you know, is not necessarily fact-based, but it appears to be. And it's harder and harder sometimes to tell the difference. Correct. You know, uh, language, I think you know this, of <clears throat> course, no? has evolved. And this is one time where language uh, is now experiencing an evolution. And you mentioned blogs, you mentioned other forms of free writing. Mm -hmm. You mentioned about people simply just expressing themselves and uh, finding an avenue, right, for their ideas, for their mm -hmm. opinions, and for their insights. But how prevalent, let me see, how prevalent or, or I, I wonder if traditional journalism, as what you had mentioned, mm -hmm. would still have a place in a highly technological world like what we're having now? Well, I think it absolutely must have a place. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I fear that okay. it will not, that it's losing its place. Because what's happening, I believe, is that as, as we've lost that hierarchy, as we've lost uh, the ability to, as writers are less and less careful about separating fact from fiction, I think a whole generation of readers is, is growing up uh, that is that has lost or is losing um, the, the capacity to think critically and to tell the difference or even to care about the difference. I think that's far more advanced that trend in America and in the West than in a place like the Philippines where still you know even now there's still some there's more tradition uh, there's the the technology has not quite uh, taken been as seductive as it was in America hasn't quite taken off and and I, frankly I see that as a hopeful sign for places like the Philippines and the developing world where maybe they'll be able to to find a way to combine the new technology but at the same time to embrace the new technology but at the same time maintain some of the traditional values of journalism uh, which you know must be able to distinguish between fact and fiction there's nothing wrong with being creative and there's nothing wrong with writing fiction, but you have to know the difference. Correct. And even journalism in itself is creative. We can go on and on and uh, maybe go on a debate with calling journalism as creative writing, mm -hmm. as well as literary writing as also creative. But mm -hmm. I'd like to ask you this, David. No? We have a good number of our young Filipinos, young Filipinas as well, who'd like to go into writing. They may not be students of communication, they may not even be students of the English language, they may probably be in a highly uh, maybe health-related field or maybe 
they are into the sciences, but they have this inherent or innate talent in writing. I wonder if you would be able to give some words of inspiration to them. Will they pursue their love of writing? Or will they pursue what is probably lucrative and, and, and make, uh, make both ends meet for yeah. us here in the Philippines? Well, I don't think those two goals are mutually exclusive. You know, I think you can do both. I think, uh, I mean, I was fortunate enough to really be able to combine both and do writing and get paid for it. That's how I made a living. That's becoming harder and harder to do. Today, yeah. Uh, and right. so I'm not sure that that many young people will be able to do that. I hope some of them will, but it doesn't matter. You know, um, they can, they can. Those are those are not mutually exclusive. You can make a living in some way, however you can, and still write. Especially with the blogosphere, especially with the internet, you can now publish things, and even have an audience. I, I know some bloggers who are very influential and have huge audiences, s some right here in Dumaguete. Yes, yes, there are. That's right, that's right. And, and their opinions matter. That's in right. In fact, people seek out their opinions no? through that's their right. blogs. No? That's and right. they, have, they have created a niche for themselves. That's they right. have created a name for themselves as well. But of course, if I am somebody who'd like to, or if I'm someone who'd like to go into writing, but perhaps I could not afford to do that, like, uh, and, and make it as, as my means of, yeah. uh, of my, my way of living or something like that, then I'll have to proceed to another career or to another profession that would make both ends meet for me or keep body and soul together. But I'd like to pursue writing. Mm -hmm. I wonder if yeah, you said that it's not actually mutually exclusive, but in the Philippines, you know, you really have to simply just love the craft for you, to, for you to pursue it. Otherwise, I will have to settle for a, a, a corporate job, perhaps. But no? you know what? That's not just true in the Philippines. That's uh -huh. true everywhere. Ah, um, okay. It's not easy to become a writer anywhere. Definitely. You know? Okay. I, I'm uh, glad you I, said that. Yes. Mm. And when I began my career, I didn't just walk into a job and start getting paid. I didn't walk into the LA Times one day ah, okay. and say, okay, I've decided I want to be a journalist. Okay. Here I am, Good. where's my desk? Okay. Doesn't work that yeah. way, you yes, know? Yes, yes. Uh, you, you, all writers start writing for free, writing for, for writing because they have to, yes, because they want yes. to. Yeah. You write yes. in your spare time. Okay. I had all kinds of jobs. I drove taxi cabs, mm -hmm. and some of it's in this book. Okay. Uh, driving taxi cabs and, you know, waiting tables and okay. doing all kinds of yeah. things. Always but, writing, but writing, writing. But you didn't stop writing. I never stopped ah, writing. Okay. You write you in your are. spare time, you write at night, Correct. you write when you're free, Correct. you write whenever you can, Correct. and you know, yeah. it's not that you want to write, it's that you must write. That's true. Yeah. And if you, do, if you don't have to write, you probably won't, Okay. because it's hard, yeah. it's you, hard work. You, you must write so that you don't atrophy, or so that your mind yeah. will be kept active. But may I ask you this, very, very quickly, before we pause for a break, um, if, uh, no, may I rephrase this probably, do you have an agent? now an agent that takes care of your marketing of your books and so on or making sure that you get published no i do not ah, um, okay and uh I it, I it would be nice to have an agent but isn't that how 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 it is in the u.s well no i mean it, not, not I mean, always or not always uh -huh. i would say most writers don't have agents oh. now because it's difficult to get agents and uh you know, it's, it would be nice to have one, um, but most writers that I know do not. Uh, and and uh, they do their own promoting. And even, even the big publishers now, I mean, it used to be in the old days that, you know, if you were published by a major publisher, they would take care of you. You know, they'd... It, it, they take they care for everything. Yeah, marketing, yeah. selling marketing, your books. Marketing, everything. But you now? Know? Much less so. Now, oh. uh, big publishers don't have the budgets to do that oh, anymore. Okay. Publishing is, is hurting, okay. you know, traditional publishing. You're, you're talking about the U.S. publishing industry. U.S. publishing oh, industry. goodness. Um, traditional publishing is hurting. Okay. Um, they, and, and partly it's because of the competition with blogs okay. and with uh, the yeah. internet. Yeah. So really, publishing is undergoing a, a tremendous transformation. Correct. There's kind of three levels. If you mm -hmm. talk about books, mm -hmm. There's sort of three levels. There's the traditional level, which mm -hmm. is the big five publishers, okay? Then there's the level of the sort of the, the middle uh, third, which is kind of, uh, or more than a third, 
which is probably the sort of smaller independent publishers like the book, like the publisher yeah. that pl published my book. They publish your book, but they still rely on the on the writers to do most of the work. Oh, okay. And then there's the then there's the lower. I it, I shouldn't say lower. There's the other third, which is really self-publishing. Mm -hmm. That's a that's huge now. Definitely. And on all all of those levels uh, now, pretty much the, it's up to the writer to mm -hmm. to promote. Unless you're famous, unless yeah. you're you know a, a house, unless you're Stephen yeah. King. Yes, or. Uh, <laughs> Or uh, J.K. Rowling. Sure. Huh? Oh my then, goodness. Then you have all kinds of people oh, to do everything gracious. for you. But if you're a, you know, the average, uh -huh. relatively unknown writer, it's yeah. pretty much up to you. Yeah. And and I chose to go with a, a sort okay. of a middle independent yeah, middle publisher indi yeah. okay. because I didn't I I didn't see any advantage to a large okay. publisher. You know, you're making you know? me happy actually with your with your <laughs> opinions on this one because uh -huh. as always we get kind of frustrated, especially with our yeah. book publishing industry. Yeah. But this is getting to be a very, very interesting conversation and interview, David. But we will pause so that we can gather our thoughts and we will be right back after these few reminders.